Okay, so we have one last talk uh, by Hernando Castano from Parity Technologies, and he's going to talk about uh, proof of authority and consensus algorithms. So please welcome his on stage. I'm surprised all of you are still awake. It's been a long night so far. Um, yeah, so I'm Hernando. Uh, I work at Parity, mainly on the Ethereum client. Um, and today I just want to talk to you guys about proof of authority. I think it's a topic that doesn't get enough love. And if it does, it's usually in the context of like consortium blockchains, which also don't get any love. Um, but I'm going to be talking more about like uh, the underlying consensus algorithms uh, and how they're used in Ethereum. So uh, what's our outline for tonight? So I'm going to go over a couple of the you know, typical proof of whatever algorithms. Uh, then we'll dig into proof of authority uh, and how proof of authority is used within Ethereum. And then after that, I'll do a little bit of a more uh, deep dive into uh, authority round and clique, which are two POA algorithms uh, in Ethereum. So uh, a consensus algorithm, what is it? So uh, in blockchain, it's really important that everybody agrees on the state of the network. So a consensus algorithm is just a way for us to kind of agree um, that everything is as it should be. So for example, if I have 10 ether, um, but Bob thinks I have five, then there's obviously a problem. So a consensus algorithm will help everybody uh, kind of come to agreement on the state of the network. Um, and in blockchain, we have a couple uh, extra challenges. Um, one, we're not, we're not in an environment where every node on the network is friendly. We've got people that are trying to be malicious, and we need to figure out how to deal with that. Uh, we also have things like network latency. Uh, all our computers aren't on the same rack. They're distributed across the world, and that poses additional challenges. So uh, how, how did we as a community come up with solutions to solve these problems? Um, the first one was proof of work. Um, so proof of work is pretty simple. All you do is you have uh, computers racing to solve this mathematical problem. And it's, it's not a trivial problem, but it's a, essentially a pretty easy problem. And if you manage to solve the problem first, you get to propose a block. And what that allows you to do is get a block reward. Um, so that's fine, it works. Uh, but it's also not very efficient. You have to buy all these you know, GPUs and nowadays ASICs. Uh, and you need to spend all this electricity uh, all to you know, compute some random hash uh, for what? For some Bitcoin or Ether. Uh, so it's not very good. Uh, so we were thinking about what's the next step? Maybe proof of stake. Oh, uh, proof of stake. Um, so in proof of stake, the idea is you'd deposit some funds, and those funds would give you uh, kind of like rights to vote. So depending on how much money you put up, uh, you get a certain percentage, percentage of the votes. Um, and if you misbehave, those uh, funds can be taken away from you. So that incentivizes you economically to act in the best uh, interest of your, your money. So um, that's good for the network. And then we also don't have this whole, oh, I need to buy like a million ASICs and spend all this money on electricity and kill the environment. Um, so that's pretty good. Um, but our focus tonight is proof of authority. So in proof of authority, we've got a trusted set of nodes. Um, and this is really good. It provides, like, it, like some of the challenges that we talked about earlier, such as malicious nodes in the network trying to like ruin all our fun, um, that kind of goes away because you know who the validators are and you can kind of trust them. That's why they're, they, they were put up. Um, and this also allows you to produce blocks at like a reliable and constant pace, which uh, if you're thinking about proof of work, you don't always know how much hash power there's going to be. Um, but with proof of authority, you know the authorities are up, you know they're going to be, um, you know they're going to be producing blocks at a certain time. Uh, so you've got a, a more reliable network. And this can also bring a higher performance depending on your setup and network conditions and that sort of thing. Um, so in Ethereum, we've got uh, a couple different test nets. Uh, one of the older test nets is called Robs or, uh, yeah, Robston. And Robston is a proof of work test net. 
which is fine. It kind of mimics mainnet conditions, but this also comes with problems. Um, unlike on mainnet, all the ether you mine on, uh, on Robston has no value. So you're spending real money to buy GPUs. You're spending real money to, to pay for electricity to mine a token that literally has no value. So what's the incentive to mine? There, there isn't one. So this leads to really low hash rates on the network. And if somebody decides to point all their uh, ASIC miners at it, um, then the network kind of screwed. And this is exactly what happened in early 2017 uh, when somebody decided to attack the network, raise the block gas price, and then just spam the network with transactions. Um, so as a community, what we kind of did is we came up with uh, some alternative test nets. Um, so we came up with Coven and Rinkby. Uh, Coven is a, a network whose consensus algorithm is authority round and it was developed by Parity. And uh, Rinkby uses the Clique engine uh, and that was developed by the Geth team, um, both in response to uh, the Robson attacks. So let's talk about authority round. Uh, so authority round or aura is uh, it's a pretty simple consensus algorithm the idea the idea is you've got a set of validators and you kind of just go uh, like through the validators sequentially uh, and everybody has like an assigned slot and like that's their time to val to propose a block um, so how this kind of works is time is divided into like very discrete steps um, using that formula over there. Um, and one, one key thing to note here is that if all the clocks of all the validators aren't synced up, they think that uh, different time corresponds to different steps. So in this case, it's really important to get everybody synchronized. Um, and then once we've got all the, all the steps assigned, we can figure out what validator is supposed to uh, propose blocks at each step. Um, just using a simple formula as well. So if we've got like an array of validators, just using the modulus of the step it is uh, with uh, the number of validators uh, in total, you can just figure out whose turn it is to propose a block. Uh, another thing that Aura provides is uh, finality. So finality means that once this block has been finalized, it can't be reverted at all. Um, in Bitcoin and Ethereum, we have a similar concept, but it's not as strong. So if you ever try and transfer money to an exchange, usually they'll wait for a certain number of block confirmations. Um, just to ensure that you know the block your transaction was included in um, won't get reverted because it was part of like the wrong fork. Um, but in Aura, uh, after you've built a certain number of blocks, that block will get finalized, and it's a very strong guarantee that uh, it'll never be changed. So one thing I want to do is go through an example of uh, what finalization looks like. So uh, this whole kind of set of, um, I don't know, like pictures, I was inspired by one of our other coworkers, Andre, because um, I thought it was like a pretty good way to show how finality works. So uh, let's imagine we've got five validators and they're going to propose five blocks. So We'll start with the pink guy over here. So he'll propose a block at step zero. That's cool. And then blue will propose a block at step one. So his block was built on top of pink's block. Makes sense. And then orange comes in. So orange will build a block who was built on top of blue's block, who was built on top of, um, of pink's block. So what we have now is at step zero, um, that block has three validators that have agreed, yes, this block is valid. Uh, and in our case, because we had five validators in total, that represents a majority, which means we can finalize a block. Um, since we have the majority, it means we don't want to revert the block. We're certain that this is what we want as part of the chain. Um, if we continue, we can see that uh, that original block that we've finalized is still finalized. Um, but now at step one, we've got another three validators that agree. Uh, so we can go ahead and finalize that as well. Finally, uh, with Green's block, um, same thing. We've got another block that has a majority of validators that 
uh, built on top of it. So we can go ahead and finalize that as well. Um, another thing that Aura provides is a way to change validator sets. So let's say that we don't like pink and we want to change it out for, um, I don't know, like a light purple or something. Uh, we can specify that in, in the chain spec. Um, so we can like hard code that essentially into the client, uh, which is great and all, but that means if you ever want to change it, you got to hard fork uh, your network, which isn't fun. Um, but what we can do is we can also have a smart contract be the one that decides when validators are, are uh, in turn and when they're allowed to propose blocks and that sort of thing. Um, so you can see that I've got like a little example of what it would look like in your chain spec. Um, so from blocks zero to 10, you can have a static list validator, or yeah, one validator, same from 10 to 20. But as soon as 20 kicks in, uh, a smart contract can manage all this stuff and you can just kind of have everything on chain and uh, your network doesn't need to fork or anything. Um, another concept I want to go over is an epoch. So um, from blocks, uh, zero to 10, that would be one epoch, because that represents um, kind of like one set of validators. And 10 to 20 would represent another set of validators. And if the contract ever decided to change uh, the set of validators, that'd be a new epoch. So we'll, we'll come back to that when we talk about clique and what an epoch is there. Um, are there any questions about Aura so far? That again. So who owns the contract that holds the list of validators? Would it be like a voting as well that whenever you want to add a validator or remove a validator? Yeah, so you've got a bit of flexibility in how you, you set up the contract, but uh, it could just be that one of the original authorities on the network also owns a contract and they can, um, they can be the one to, to add or remove validators. Um, yeah, it, like it, it's got a bit of flexibility, once again, because it is a smart contract. All right, thanks. All right, so Clique is the second consensus engine we have. Um, and this one's also got a similar background as Aura in that it was developed uh, in part due to the Robson attacks. Uh, and this is, this one's actually specified properly, unlike Aura. Aura's got like a weak kind of set of documentation, and most of it is just in code. But um, this is defined in EIP 225, if you want to go read it. And it was uh, proposed by Peter from the Geth team. Um, and the goal for, for Clique is really to standardize what a proof of authority algorithm looks like. Uh, and if, we, if we're able to standardize it, we're able to implement it in multiple clients, which is exactly what was done uh, for the Gourley testnet, um, which is a clique-based um, testnet. It was launched, I think, two months ago. Um, and I think we've got like quite a few clients working with it now, if you want to go check it out. Um, block proposals also work a bit differently in clique. So in Aura, every validator had like you know defined step. Here it's a little more loosey goosey, where um, validators are either in turn or not in turn. And what this means is, if I'm the in turn validator, I have like a priority or uh, I have an advantage in proposing a block, and my block um, weighs more. Whereas if I'm out of turn, I can still propose a block. Um, but it, it might not have the same weight as one that is in turn. Um, what this means, though, is that the network never really stops because somebody can always propose a block uh, at any given point. Um, and the strategy that's typically used is like, if you're in turn, you want to like, uh, you want to propose a block as quickly as you're you're able to. Whereas if you're out of turn, you wait like a random amount to give a chance. Uh, for the intern validator to propose a block. Um, yeah, so as I was saying earlier, like if if an intern validator does propose a block, their block has a higher difficulty, um, which is good because the fork choice rule in Clique is the chain with the, the highest difficulty. 
Um, so it'll favor chains that have more blocks produced by intern validators um, instead of having chains that are kind of made with, with random out of turn validators. So here's another big difference. So in Aura, we said, oh, let's just use a smart contract to change the validator set. Um, that's fine, but it, it could, be, uh, could be improved as well. So uh, in Clique, what you do is, uh, as a validator, you can actually change, or you can vote to change the val validator set at every block. So if I propose a block, I can say, hey, I want to add Bob as a validator. Uh, and then next block, I can say, no, I want to remove uh, you know, Alice as a validator. Uh, so I can do this throughout the protocol, and it's, it's really good for clients to sync up, because um, all they kind of have to do is follow the different votes um, and see you know, oh, who at block 100 is actually a validator. Um, and I guess the, the key ideas uh, for the voting in Clique is that you get one vote per block. And then you also need a majority of uh, validators to vote on a certain, um, on a certain action for it to be enacted. Uh, so it can't just be me trying to vote Bob out uh, every time. Like, that, that won't go through. I need a majority consensus for that to, to get enacted. So Epoch. Um, so in... In Aura, if you want to figure out who the validator sets are, or yeah, who the validators are, and they're in a smart contract, you need access to state, and that's something that like a light client wouldn't have access to, because uh, they're just looking at headers. Um, but an epoch kind of uh, encapsulates all the info that a light client or even a regular client could use to sync. Um, so an epoch block is a special block which contains no votes. But the ones we talked about in the previous slide. It contains a current list of authorities. And then um, another kind of quirk about it is that any vote that kind of wasn't settled in the, in the previous epoch gets dropped. Um, so it, like, it checkpoints uh, where we are in the, in the network and who the validators are, and it gives you a nice, clean way to sync up. Uh, and then in, in Clique, the default is every 30,000 blocks, which is the same as in ETH, um, just because they didn't want to like start fiddling with stuff that didn't need to be fiddled with. All right, so now for the fun part. So uh, as part of EIP-225, there's a bunch of consensus tests that you need to pass. Um, and you need to remember some of these rules, all right? So let's start with an easy one. So uh, actually, maybe let me walk you through what's going on here. So we're going to start off with uh, a list of validators, so that's signers. And then there's going to be a couple blocks that are proposed. Um, so in this case, you see signer A is voting for C to get deauthorized. So that's how you'd read that. And then you can also have auth as true, which means, oh, I want to add this person to uh, the validator set. Uh, and then the, the goal of this is to see what the validator set would look like after, um, after all these blocks. So can anybody tell me what the validator set would look like after these two blocks? Come on, this is an easy one. All right, let's go through it. So um, validator A is voting to deauthorize C. All right, so that's one vote against C. Next block comes around, uh, validator B is also voting against C. So we've got two out of three validators that don't want C in the list. So we'll deauthorize C. So C won't be part of the validator list anymore. All right, let's do another one. Uh, the, the empty B is just B's proposing a block, doesn't need to vote. Any any guesses? All right, A B A B C. <laughs> Who 
Who knows? It could be a trick question. Maybe there's a D. All right. So in this case, it's AB. Um, are you guys confused by that? So in this case, at the very beginning, to get a majority vote, only A needs to vote on anything. So he voted for B. Uh, therefore, B becomes a validator. So when we hit, when B proposes a block, there's already two validators there, which means thinking back to the first uh, quiz question, uh, we need two validators to add another validator. So the other vote for C won't go through. All right, let's do another one. No change? All right, anybody else? <laughs> All right, no change. Let's see. Yep, you're right. Um, yeah, this one might be a little sneaky because, you know, you have 50% of the vote, but that's not a majority, um, which means uh, the vote for C would not go through. All right, last one. Got to think back to the rules on epoch blocks. You guys want me to flip back to what those rules were? Yes, no? Sure. All right. So contains no vote. Um, contains a list of current authorities. All non-settled votes are discarded. So let's go back. No change. A what? <laughs> All right, so yeah, let's go through it. So initially we've got A, B, um, then they vote for C. OK, cool. B produces a block. Then we've got a checkpoint. So that's the important bit. Um, because we have the checkpoint, that first vote gets dropped. Um, a decision wasn't made, so it gets dropped which means um, that final vote only has uh, one vote towards it, which means uh, no change. Had the checkpoint not been there, then yeah, the proposal would have gone through. So that's all I've got for you guys today. Uh, if you guys have any questions about uh, 